Uh, it keeps the dangerous wall away in the vessel. So you do it once and you do it right. Welcome back uh, to the next episode of Endoscopy Essentials. Welcome Shyam Baradarajulu. In the last episode we have spoken about the preparation, imaging, planning. Uh, now we're going into the thing and uh, we are going into cyst drainage. One question maybe beforehand, the ideal location is the stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, are you afraid of the duodenum, pancreatic head? Not actually. Um. When you intervene in a patient, it is placing a stent is just the very first part of the procedure. A lot of things can happen downstream, uh, like the most common thing being a necrosectomy, a transluminal necrosectomy. If you're going to place the stent through your impossible location, it's very difficult subsequently to do anything meaningful. Then you have to place a second stent and the collection has become smaller, so you don't have a good access point. So you do it once and you do it right. And I always try to go to the distal stomach. And that's usually the best place because if you're placing your stent in the gastric cardia, when you pass your endoscope, you have to take an acute angulation to go and do all these things. So I always try to go somewhere in the mid body of the mm -hmm. stomach so that it gives me a good angle, scope stability, and I can perform as many interventions as I can. And I also avoid the duodenum uh, only because the real estate is very small for you to perform uh, anything. And generally, most collections near the duodenum can also be accessed from the distal stomach. Because when you go in by U.S., the, the uh, most promising location between quotes seems to be proximal. So that's you correct. have to look for something more distally, if ever possible. That's the message. That is the message, yes. I always start at the, from the duodenal bulb and I pull my scope. Mm -hmm. It's technically a little challenging to deploy a stent uh, in the mid or the distal stomach in a patient with a big collection just because there is so much compression. But I think taking the time to thoughtfully do it at the first time is, is, is very rewarding because subsequently the procedure becomes much easier. And um, what's your type of sedation? General anesthesia in big cysts with a lot of fluid? Um, almost always. In almost particularly always. if there is necrosis, I always uh, intubate those patients. So Shyam, Show us the, some practical examples, videos, pictures. We are keen to see them. Okay. Sometimes uh, we always say that the cyst should be as close to the gastric wall as possible for an intervention. And then there are these rules that it has to be exactly one, one centimeter, one centimeter yeah. or 15 millimeter. But these things are not very absolute because there's a lot of inflammation associated with the cyst that you can you know, go up a little bit more, even up to 15 millimeters. Say, for example, uh, you see a patient here and you see the arrow uh, on the patient and that's exactly where uh, the cyst ends. I will do it again. So that is where the cyst starts. So it's about 15 millimeters on the gastric wall. So you deploy a luminoposing metal stent as close as possible to the cyst and then subsequently you pass a wire. The wire is now deep into the collection by going through the stent and then you use a balloon and you dilate the lumen of the stent and a little area beyond the stent so that you create a tunnel to go into the collection. And once that is done, you can see that we can access a fluid collection that is even as far as 20 millimeters. One has to be careful so that you're not going into the uh, peritoneal cavity and so on. But if there's a lot of inflammation, I don't think there's a steadfast rule that it has to be exactly 10 or 12 millimeters beyond which you cannot perform an intervention. But beyond 15, it's going to be difficult, right? It can, it's going to be, yeah. you can cause leakage, correct. Yeah. And then uh, this is, a, uh, we can go on and show you where a stent should be placed. So all those X marks are places where one should not place a stent mm -hmm. because it gets very, very difficult to access them. So I'm going to play this video uh, that's going to tell you where exactly you can access a collection at the most ideal location. So this is a patient who comes with a fluid collection and then you start at the GE junction and then you suck air uh, and then you advance your scope down and you start seeing uh, necrosis and then you go towards the pylorus and you start seeing a luminal compression on the stomach and if you retract the scope that's exactly the place where you want to deploy because it's a good angle it's midway in between the esophagus uh, 
uh, and the pylorus and it gives you a lot of scope stability for a endoscopic necrosectomy at a later time. And I always, almost always place a 20 millimeter stent because it makes necrosectomy much easier because the lumen is large, you can use a therapeutic gastroscope. So now you see a stomach in the mid, uh, mid stomach, which is a very easy place uh, to intervene. It's also very important uh, that when you place a stent that you irrigate very well, because if you don't irrigate well, the debris will occlude the stent lumen mm -hmm. and then they come back with sepsis in a few days. So I spent about 15 minutes uh, after I placed a stent just for irrigation so that I can extract out as much mechanical debris as possible. And this is very critical. But not doing necrosectomy in the first sessions or, uh, or maybe perhaps yes, if there's too much uh, necrotic stuff? I think if the cyst wall is very stable, mm -hmm. if the patient is inpatient, which they are almost always, you can do necrosectomy. The trick with the necrosectomy is that um, there is bleeding. When you dilate it at the same time, the stent lumen is dilated, they can have bleeding. So you have to be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there's nothing wrong in necrosectomy, the intact session, because what you do is you actually accelerate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the discharge of patient from the hospital. They don't stay there for a long time. But there is a tendency to place the stent, irrigate, and then wait and see and come back for the necrosectomy? That is right. Unless it's, there's excessive amount, etc. That is uh, very true. Because it's very hard uh, by EUS imaging to predict the future on how these things happen. Because if most of these debris are just liquefied material, they will just spontaneously drain out mm -hmm. and you don't have to do anything for the patient. So this is the video that shows you why uh, irrigation is key for these patients. And you can see there's a lot of necrotic material uh, in the stent and uh, within the cavity. And then after you deploy the stent, this necrosis will just, as the, as the fluid evacuates, they have a tendency to just go into the lumen of the stent and cause an occlusion. And these patients in another two days, when they are in the hospital, continue to have fever and an elevated mm -hmm. white count. And when you come back, you will always see this room of tissue that you can see here on this particular case. So that's why uh, irrigation is important. So let's pause here for a second and, and uh, get back to the location thing. Um, you probably can tell from CT whether you have a chance to have a more distal location. If the, if the cyst is in the tail and very proximal, you won't be able. Or um, what's, your, what's your approach? That is uh, true. I, th I don't think we have much leverage if the collection is located on the distal mm -hmm. body or the tail. Then the gastric cardia and the proximal stomach are the only places where you can access. One little trick is uh, when the scan is done, the patient is almost always supine. So at EUS, when we perform these procedures, they are in the left lateral position in general and things tend to move a little bit. So you have to try to position the patient a little bit and see if you can get some real mm -hmm. estate for an optimal site for stent deployment which is a further argument for intubation. That's correct. So Shyam, we, we talked about location and angle and so on. Uh, sometimes you don't have a big choice, but the, your key message is to go down as distally as possible. That's correct. And don't don't give up uh, and stay in the proximal stomach. Yes, it just makes, it, yeah, it makes re-intervention so much harder if you stay in the proximal stomach. But then there's this huge accessory discussion, which stent? We used to have plastic and everybody was happy and then the, the lumen opposing stents came and everybody was unhappy about the plastic stents. So what, what's your algorithm? Uh, my algorithm is very straightforward. If I have a unilocular pseudocyst with a fairly intact pancreatic duct, I just place a lumen opposing metal stent. It's so much easier. But if the pancreatic duct is blocked completely by a stone, and if I'm not going to use extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy and RFI 4C failure, then I will place a plastic stent because, and I will just let it indwell permanently to prevent a recurrence. For a necrotic collection, I think luminoposing metal stent is the way to go because it's wide, it evacuates much faster, symptom relief is quicker. But there are some caveats. All the studies have shown at the end of six months, the outcomes are comparable. If you've got a disconnected duct, and the collection is only six to seven or eight centimeters. And if you place a luminoposing metal stent, what happens is when you take the stent out, the cavity is collapsed. There's no space left to exchange and place a plastic stent. So if I'm sure a patient has got a disconnected duct and the collection is only six or eight centimeters, 
then I will place a double pigtail, two or three double pigtail plastic stems primarily at the index mm -hmm. session so that I don't have to go back and struggle with the process of exchange. So, so the theory is everything, you know, there, there's collapse and then you don't have any space to intervene. You do, perhaps you deteriorate the status of the disconnected duct. That's what, that's what people think happens when, uh -huh. the, uh, when, the duct is, when the cavity is collapsed. Then you've got the small segment in the tail that has nowhere to drain. Then these are the patients who continue to have ongoing symptoms and then they develop collateral vasculature, bleeding and so on. Once you reach that point, the surgeon is not interested in operating because the, there's high morbidity to do a distal pancreatectomy on those patients. So therefore, when they come to us initially for an intervention, we should be able to foresee all these future problems and treat them with a plastic mm -hmm. stent so that you can minimize this from happening. It can still happen, but at least there's a possibility we can prevent it. And plastic in metal, that's also a discussion in randomized studies. What's your approach? So, huh. I think the beauty of a luminoposing metal stent is the simplicity of the procedure. So if you want to put on a plastic through the metal stent, I might as well place a plastic stent because long-term outcomes are comparable between techniques. But people think that if you place in a plastic stent through the lumen, it keeps the stent patent and it is not occluded by debris. And there have been some retrospective data that supports it. But in my practice, I don't do that. And it might decrease bleeding. That was also the hope. Uh, that it keeps the dangerous wall away and the vessels, but that's right. That has not been proven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even in retrospective studies, that has not been proven. Uh, but the theory is actually to keep the patency of the luminoposing metal stent is where uh, the double pigtail plastic comes to play. Okay, so the, the next issue, it was mentioned several times, and uh, it's an issue I never fully understood, so you have to help me. In, in this very session is the disconnected duct mm -hmm. because there's probably in order to form a fluid collection there's always some interruption or some leakage or so of the duct so a real disconnection means there's a distal end which is disconnected and drains into the cyst and I find it utterly difficult to really diagnose this reliably so enlighten me so uh, we, have, we have a cartoon in front of us, mm -hmm. and this is a classic example of a disconnected duct. Generally, this happens in the genu of the pancreas, or what we call the watershed area, where there is a decreased vascular supply, and during a part of necrosis, the pancreas is disconnected. Now, you've got the tail and the body that does not communicate with the ampulla, and then this pancreas continues to secrete pancreatic juice. And, and, and I mean, on, on imaging, there is then over a certain distance, absolutely no pancreatic tissue, zero. It's only fluid connection, even in a thin sliced CT. And that is correct. What, uh, what the definition should be, the downstream pancreatic duct should empty into this space or cavity right in the middle of the gland. And this is a classic uh, definition for a disconnected duct. I, I understand the theory, but mm -hmm. my difficulty is to see it. It's very difficult to see it. Or uh, to really say this is it, and um, yeah, because when the fluid is gone, the pancreatic mm. duct might be connected mm. again, or so that's why to diagnose a disconnected duct, a CT scan is not the greatest technology, and MRI is not a great technology either during the acute phases. Only when the, the cyst is completely resolved, and if you have removed the endoprosthesis, then the signaling is less, and you can get a high quality MRI, preferably an MRCP with secretin. And that is the gold standard to diagnose disconnected pancreatic duct in lieu of an ERCP. ERCP is excellent. The problem is it's an invasive procedure. Yeah. But that's, you mainly conclude that initially it can be tough. And you can't predict. So the best diagnosis is during the course. That's true. I mean, we have some data to show that by an EUS, uh, when you track the pancreatic tail, and if, it em and if it empties into the duct, it's a disconnected duct. But occasionally, if the collection is very big, it's very hard to trace that duct and see where it empties and so on. So follow-up imaging is the best time to diagnose for sure a disconnected duct. Thank you. It's a little bit reassuring because I think this term is readily used, maybe overused. Yes, disconnected I, duct exists. Yeah. We don't see anything. Bad CT, pops, disconnected duct. It's, a, it's actually very difficult to make the diagnosis. It's not easy. Uh, it's, a, it's a radiological diagnosis made at follow-up for us intraprocedurally or pre-intervention to conclusively say somebody has a disconnected duct can be, can be very tough.
But if there is an assumption, then uh, you you said it before. If the the cyst or the collection is not too big, you rather play uh, place plastic stents. That's correct. I place plastic stents, mm -hmm. and the collection is not very big. Only because I'm worried when I come back, I don't have the real estate to exchange. Uh, to remove the lamps, and then the cavity immediately collapses mm -hmm. on me, mm -hmm. and then I, I don't have the place to put on a wire and place double pigtail plastic stents. So, so we better call it a probably interrupted pancreas. That's correct, it's a probably an interrupted okay. pancreas. Okay, thank you. Now I, I'm more in line <laughs> with you. So this is uh, a simple video on how follow-up happens. So here's a patient yeah. uh, who comes with a necrotizing pancreatitis, and now uh, he's coming up for a follow-up uh, to see us. Mm -hmm. And you see the cavity has completely collapsed. There is very minimal necrotic uh, material draining out of the cavity. And this stent, as you have seen, is placed somewhere in the distal stomach, which is my uh, ideal location. So I use a rat tooth forceps, and then I pull the stent out. And this shows you by EUS, uh, your disconnected duct. So that is the pancreatic head. The dark area you are suddenly seeing is in the neck of the region. This is where the stent was removed from. Now more uh, cranial toward, towards the spleen, you see some little bit of pancreas. Here's the place from where the stent was removed. So I use a catheter and I try to coil a guide wire into that cavity. And once you make about two coils, uh, that's sufficient to place a plastic stent. And I prefer to place one or two, seven French, three or four centimeter double pigtail stents and I let them in well completely. People always question the wisdom of this and they wonder, does this really communicate with the pancreas or is it all too much hypothesis? So in this particular case, you can see what I will do is once I have placed the stent, I go to the pancreatic duct and I inject it with a, nine, with a 22 gauge needle and you can see the contrast extravasating mm. into the cavity telling us that this is not a voodoo theory but a real theory that maintaining a plastic stent is what will prevent recurrence in these patients. Would you do ERCP now? To, or I mean, that's a bit unusual to puncture the pancreatic duct and uh, so there do are the two, visualization. I think if you do an ERCP and you're successfully cannulating the pancreatic duct, and if you don't see any opacification downstream, then more than likely there's a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. But if your cannulation fails, then it gets a little tricky. But I will not perform uh, your pancreatogram just to uh, with the EUS just to demonstrate DPDS, you can do that with a good quality MRI. And filling the cavity is not possible because it all refluxes. Yeah, into it the will stomach. reflux back. It's uh, that's yeah. a very wishful thinking that we yeah. fill it with contrast and it's going to seep into the duct. It Any never experience happens. with balloon blocking? No. We have tried it. Not very successful. It still refluxes. It comes back yeah. because I think the duct is too small and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you have to fill the cavity and it has to f the contrast has to find its way into that duct. There's I think not it's enough pressure. Not, not enough pressure. Okay. Good. So since I finally understood the disconnected uh, duct, um, I think we will pause here and okay. come back um, with uh, the necrotic topic uh, in the next episode. Sure. Thanks very much. Thank Ryan. you.